Hey everyone, it's Jim from Vows and More, an online vintage tube store. And today, in Tube Lab number 39, we're going to take a look at my newest prototype 6P7S monoblock. But first, caution everyone, electronics and tube amplifiers can have very high voltages present, which can be lethal. Exercise extreme caution when working around them. Always consult a professional technician when in doubt. And if you're enjoying my videos, please hit the like button and subscribe. Today we're going to look at my newest prototype amp. It's a low-powered SE, or single entered amp, that uses, get ready for this, the DET20, or the CV6, or the 2C22, or the 7193, or the 6S8S, just to name a few. It was developed as a radar tube uh, in the Second World War, and essentially it's a development of the 6J5. And for those of you who don't know it, um, the let me grab one here. The 6J5 makes up two 6J5s make up a 6SN7. So. This is uh, essentially a 6J5 with two top caps. One is for the plate connection, the high voltage, and the other is for the grid connection, where we put our audio on, or the signal on, depending on how you're using the tube. This particular one here, um, I've shown before actually, it's rebranded for GE uh, UK, but in fact it's a Marconi tube. It's a lovely made tube. I've got another one here. This is, can you see the logo? 6C8C, that's the Russian. So it's actually, their C is RS. So it's actually, in English, it's a 6S8S. And look at that beautiful logo. That's the uh, Svetlana logo, the Flying C or Winged C logo. And actually, when I fired this up for its very first listening test, this was the tube that was in the driver's spot. And the uh, amp just sounded glorious. Let's look at the power tube. This is a first for me, this, this factory. I didn't know the symbol at all or logo. I'm not even sure what that is. I think it's a V. Anyways, it stands for the Yulian, Yulianov um, factory. It's a state-owned military factory. Um, and they seem to have made a lot of these tubes. So I suspect that this had a military application. The factory is located in Yulianovsk, which is um, famous because it's the birthplace of Lenin. It's located um, east southeast of Moscow. And let's take a quick look at this power tube. Now, you might say, why are you flying around with what is essentially uh, an old Russian TV tube, right? That's what this is. Uh, it, the reason why is. I like to fool around with different tubes. These are affordable. Uh, very few people are doing anything with them, so they're just sitting in warehouses waiting for somebody to start building apps with them. And if you look at the plate structure, you might say, oh, geez, that looks a lot like uh, an early 6L6. Well, it's, it's actually in the same family as the 6L6. It's a beam-powered tetro, just like a 6L6. Just because its amplification duties were for TVs doesn't mean if its specifications are adequate that it can't do audio and do audio brilliantly. Have a look at how it's made. Can you see those little white discs? Those are wonderful little ceramic spacers that hold the plate to, um, to, the, the, um, to the spacers. There's one, there's two, another two so there's four per tube and of course whenever you see a tube with a single top connection it's almost always the high voltage or plate connection that's up there okay let's take a quick look at the amp now this is just the first pass we'll go into more detail after I'm I'm I finished some listening tests and I finished fooling around the circuit and I'll publish the circuit like I always like to do as well at some point in the future. So it's a very simple monoblock. It's got an RCA in 
just a simple on off switch. Um, it's got a power transformer, an output transformer, a single driver tube, and a single output tube. Now, single ended amps are, are class A amps and they're they, they have a unique sound and the reason why um, they have a unique sound is that the, the output tube, the power tube, is running 100% duty cycle. So it's always on. The signal does not get phase inverted like in a class AB push-pull amp. The whole signal goes through this amp continuously. The downside is that you have lower power and more heat. With a class AB or push-pull amp we'd have a pair of these power tubes per channel, at least. You can actually have more in parallel. And you would think, well, that would give us double the power, right? And double the heat. Well, in fact, because one tube is is operating while the other one's idling, and then the other one is operating while the other one's Id idling, you can actually run these things a lot hotter. So you can get almost four times the power out of a single-ended tube using the same tubes, depending on the circuit topology and the tube type, of course, right? Everything depends. So we've just got a pair of speaker jacks out and of course an IEC fused inlet here. Let's just flip it over because this is really, this is the amplifier, right? Well, the amplifier is the tubes, but this is the circuitry that ties it together. So we've got, we've got a universal power supply, PCB, which it's the first time I use this board, and we're going to look at them in a minute. I just brought them into the store. Um, and uh, I actually have Hugh and Hugh's friend to thank for helping with the design work. And we spent, oh, a couple of weeks going back and forth over the winter getting a uh, preamp board and getting a power supply board uh, ready so that I could order them. So thanks a lot, Hugh. Um, you guys did a great job. The, there's some minor revisions that we'll make to the next batch of boards, but essentially you got it perfect. Um, anyways, this made the building of the power supply a snap. It went really well. And interestingly enough, this amp, the single-ended amp, is the quietest single-ended amp I've ever built. In fact, it's dead quiet. Now, I've been able to take everything I've learned building preamps and amplifiers and put it into the design. Um, you know, without having to fool around with revisions trying to make it quiet. Uh, and if you take a look at, here's one of my, one of my power supply boards. And I just use proto boards because, and I use my, you know, handy mechanical fastening system because you're always, when you're experimenting, you're always disconnecting and reconnecting stuff. Anyways, I have a feeling going from this, this type of board, hardwired, um, to this heavy traced board. We'll look at the board in a minute. It's, uh, the boards are beautifully made though. Anyways, I think this helped reduce the noise level. A large choke, this is a 10 Henry, 100 milliamp choke, doesn't hurt. <laughs> Probably plays a big role in getting things quiet as well. And um, so let's just follow the circuit really fast. So we've got our power supply. Here's our high voltage, our B plus. This is our driver stage right here. This is a, la a late stage filter cap. And this also contributes to the quietness of the amp. It's a very simple circuit because we only, unlike if we had a 6SN7 in a driver stage, we'd have to wire up two complete tubes, right? So we're only wiring up one. Here's a little coupling cap that brings us from the driver stage over to the power tube. And it's even simpler. And the reason why it's so simple, of course, is that we've got two connections are actually on the top. I'm sorry, one is on the top here. And you can see them, actually. Um, let's see if I can get in here. Here's the driver tube. Here's the, the red wire right here. That is the high voltage, the plate connection. And the white wire down here, that's the grid. And notice how they sneak really quickly through the top plate. And over here, the same thing. And the reason for that is you don't want these wires fooling around and picking up uh, noise inside of the amp, stray electrical um, noise that's always floating around inside of amplifiers. So I got them off their connection and through the plate real quick. 
The other thing that helps with low noise is a really hard, this is an AC filament feed, right? That's your 6.3 volt AC. It could be DC, but a lot of power amps, it's just simpler to run, um, run AC. That's what our transformers provide. So it's hard twisted, and I like to fly them in high. You see? Can you see that? How it flies in on top? It's easy to install. Some people like to put them around the edge of the chassis, like this, this section over here, and bring them in at ground level, right tight to the to the top plate, and sneak them in and put them in first. That's that's a totally valid way of doing it. But I like flying them in high. I saw somebody showed how to do this once, and I copied the method, and I love it. It's easy to install them at the end. You get them in. And when you fly them like this, you keep them away from everything. You just drop them straight onto their connections. Here's the connection for the output transformer. And there's two taps. So there's a, right now I've got the 4 ohm. I don't know, it's pretty dark in that corner, isn't it? I've got the 4 ohm on the green wire. Uh, I'm going to try My speakers are, are nominal 4 ohms. I'm going to try the 8 ohm just for fun to see, but it, because you've got two taps, you don't, you don't clip off this tap. You make, it, you make it so that you can just tie, it'll just tie down here. I guess you can't see that. I'll just tie it down like that. And um, someday if I have 8 ohm speakers, I just unplug one connection and I can bring up the, the correct tap. I mean, a more sophisticated amp would have a switch on the back, but uh, that works just fine. The main thing that you'll notice is that the amp is very clean. There's not a lot of wiring, and it'll be even cleaner when I decide which which taps I'm going to use. This this is another tap on the on the uh, power transformer. It it just gives us a different winding on the input side to the transformer, depending on what your house voltage is. And currently, I'm on one that gives me exactly 6.32 volts to AC. For the heater supply, so I'm probably on the right one. It drops the B plus a little bit, but the amp sounds fantastic. So I'm probably going to stick with what I have, and eventually I'll cut this back and clip it. Okay, that's a good first run. I'm actually in love with this little this little mono block. It sounded so good without any modifications that I, it's going to be I'm going to be hard pressed to start fooling around with it. But in order to make proper listening tests. I need to have stereo. So I'm actually going to take the prototype and I'm going to duplicate it and build an exact... I'm going to build a mirror image for the first time ever. I'm going to have a left and a right or a right-hand channel. Blah, blah, blah. You know what I mean. <laughs> so the, the amps will actually be flipped from one side. So one amp will have the uh, RCA input on this side. So this obviously is the left channel. And... Um, the other one will have it on the other side. So, and these guys will all, all flip over. So it's a mirror image. I've never done a monoblock that way. In fact, I've never done that with any amp before. So we'll see if I get all messed up and build, you know, half one way and half the other way. I've always wanted to do that. I, monoblocks irritate me because they're, they're generally built as either a, a left, left, or a right, right. And to me, that's not right. It doesn't look, it just doesn't look good. I, I want them to be mirror images. Okay, so that's just an aesthetic, right? Maybe it helps a little bit that your RCA doesn't have to jump all the way over and connect up like this on one side, whereas the other side it comes in on the close side. Anyways, enough of that. I'm just yammering on. We'll see more of this amp as uh, the testing goes. Now, the plan is sometime, hopefully in the fall, to start releasing simple kits of the various prototypes that have been successful. Probably starting with the 6 or 12 SN7 preamp. I wish we could come up with a good name for that. Um, I've been working with my, my son Charles, who's been helping out a lot with the various projects in the store. And we've, we've gone through, oh, dozens of names. In fact, we had two or three fabulous names for this little amp, or sorry, the little preamp the 6 or 12 SN7. And uh, each time we, we, we shoot the name at each other and say, what about this? this is, that's a great name. 
uh, one of us will say, well, let's get on and Google that name. And sure enough, some amp manufacturer somewhere some t at some time has already used that great name. So we need a unique name for the that little preamp that I love so much. Okay, let's take a look at some some wonderful stuff that came into the store this week. And let's start with these little uh, circuit boards. This is a universal power supply board and um, they are made with the heaviest um, fiberglass the manufacturer could give me. Look at that, isn't that amazing? It's probably overkill but because I've also got a preamp um, board for the 6 or 12 SN7 that has a tube socket that has to mount underneath the top plate, I wanted just to go with solid, solid board. I want all my boards to be the same, first off, same quality. And um, when you've got a, a tube socket and you're pushing in and out and it's anchored, you know, it's not that far apart, but when it's anchored like that, you don't want the board flexing at all because too much flexing and you'll break a trace eventually or a solder joint. Anyways, uh, they've got the heaviest copper traces that I could get, two ounces. And I went with the um, older method of laying down the solder pads. So these are actually um, a lead tin mixture as opposed to a modern pad, which would be um, a silver blend. And the reason I've done that is because I find uh, the modern pads, the silver silver blended uh, amalgams of, of blah, I'm having trouble talking today. The, the more modern uh, silver blends or alloys are tough to solder. And I do a lot of soldering and if I'm having trouble with them, beginners are gonna have a real hard time. These uh, older, older um, uh, lead pads, they solder beautifully. Now, here's a tip. You should prep your board before you actually use it. Here's the underside, the double-sided boards, of course. And I love double-sided because you can actually build this way or this way. They're identical on either side. Now, you, you won't have the printing, of course. So when you get a fresh board in, bring it to the sink, put a little dish soap on a scrubby pad. This is a real scrubby. This is a 3M. Don't use one of those cheap green things from the dollar store. Put a little tiny dish soap on it and just scrub it under the running water. Both directions, same thing on the other side, and that will help prep the board for soldering. It only, and make sure you dry it thoroughly, or it could get exciting when you bring um, a soldering iron to, to your pad. Anyways, um, that makes a big difference. And a little drop, of course, of flux. A very tiny, tiniest amount of flux you can get onto it. And Bob's your uncle. Anyways, these are in the store now. They're not expensive and you can build a, it's designed so that you can build a, a whole bunch of configurations. So you can build a full bridge with four diodes or you can build a, a normal center tapped two diode configuration. So you just use D1 and D2 and skip D3 and D4 and the circuit will just work perfectly the way it's wired up. Anyways, thanks a lot, Hugh and Hugh's friend. Uh, those are just great. What else came in? Oh, yeah. Um, a whole bunch of melts, 6SL7s and 6SN7 metal bases came in. And this is a fun story. These have actually been in shipment since, I think, March. March sometime. They were shipped three times. And three time, two times, I guess, they came back. And, uh, I mean, in some countries, there's been so few international flights. These are all moved by air, of course. Uh, so few international flights that they just couldn't get out. And the box was large. There was a lot of tubes in that box. So small boxes get through no problem, but big boxes, they've been kicking back. <laughs> Anyways, they finally got through. So they only went in the store. These are new old stock. And... Um, everybody knows this is one of my favorite 6SL7s. This and the Sylvania, they're both from the 1950s. They're just beautiful sounding tubes. Um, anyways, they went in the store about three days ago and somebody started buying them an hour after they went in. I couldn't believe it. And then 
people started rushing into the store over the next couple of days and somebody bought I think three of them. Anyways, um, it's tough to keep them in stock. Uh, they're 1950s tubes and there's really a finite supply and one of the sad things is so many of these will test poorly when they come in even new old stock and so many of them will test noisy. It's, it's, this, is a, this is a high gain tube from the 1950s. It's just the way it is folks unfortunately and it's part of the reason why they're so expensive. There's a lot of labor to process the tube. There's money lost buying them. Sometimes I get you know compensated by the seller and sometimes I don't. I'm not going to sell noisy or mediocre tubes to my customers and I'm certainly not going to listen to them myself. Now when I say noisy, I don't mean plug this thing in and the speakers are howling at you. I mean you're going to get a little bit of crackling, a little bit more hiss than is acceptable. You can't hear that when the music's playing, but when you get to a silent passage, if you have efficient speakers like I do, you're going to hear it. So those get weeded out. As, as best as I can, I test everything electrically and everything I can listen to uh, on my own equipment, I sit down and actually listen to the tube for all those qualities. Low noise, good sound. Okay, what else came in? Oh yeah, okay, I've got something special for you. So, everybody knows I'm in love with the Mullard EL34 XF2s from the 1960s. And I've come to specialize in them. And I've never had a quad of new old stock. I've had new old stock tubes, but I've never had enough to make a quad. Now, two of them are branded Philips Miniwatt. And one of them is a G and one is an RCA. But they're all identical tubes. They're all, because they're brand new, they've all got, their date codes are all nice and manufacturing codes. They're all XF2, Blackburn. And we've got, we actually got clear date codes on them all. As far as I can tell, it doesn't matter when in the 60s the XF2s were made. They all sound identical. They all appear to have been identically well made. But here's, here's the joy. Well, not joy for me. Typically, um, you'll find 26 milliamps to low 30 milliamps will be a good used. Now, bad used obviously is going to have a lower emission and new old stock typically starts around 30 ish milliamps up to about 35 even as high as 40. These are testing down around what a used um, EL34 Mullard would test at. They're coming in at 25 and 26 milliamps. Now it's a nice tight matched quad but because you're testing a little lower than new old stock and testing used, I've actually got them in the store now as, um, as a used quad. There's only one of them in the store. That's all I've got. I may never see this again. So they're going to actually sell for the used price, which is still expensive. There's just no way around it. They're high demand tubes. The wholesale price is ridiculous. And it, you know, and it takes a lot of time and effort to get match quads. A lot of money too. But anyways, they're in the store and here's the fun bit. You're going to like this. You can use the standard code that I showed you I think last week on this quad and get the full discount. Neat, eh? Okay. And you can also use, if you're buying something else, you can use the regular codes. Remember I've got $20 flat rate shipping around the world and if your order is $150 or more after discount, the shipping's on me, folks. Okay, stay safe, everyone. This is Jim from Vowels and More, signing off. Cheers, everyone.